It's not interpreted when you compile it. It's a secret. Storage balancing plugin. This is the ones that were used yesterday in the advanced training as a demo pur uh, for demo uh, purposes, but also as a very standard use case in uh, people who use sequencers. They get a lot of data coming in. They need to uh, work on it in certain ways, and they need to flow their data to the right places. This is a very compelling use case, and now it's running at C++ speed without the burden, the burden, the flexibility, the burden of running it in Python and spinning up that interpreter every time, right? So that's the scope of what we've got now. We expect, as prototyping starts to begin in your labs and your companies, this can get very interesting. There, there could be a Ruby one, there could be a Java one, there could, there could be all kinds of stuff, right? Each one of these, the Python is about four to 500 lines of C++. Not too terribly awful. It only, it, it implements, what is it now, five, six? Six um, functions, basically. Its job is to do six things. This one does six things, 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 right? It's only a few hundred lines of code. It does a job, it gets out. Six things. Next slide. So I'm going to show you a little bit about the configuration. Obviously, once there's a GUI for all of this, you don't know any of it. So right now, there's no GUI because we just made it. This is the server config JSON. This is a chunk of the server config JSON file. Out of the box, it comes with this chunk. And this chunk, this is the, what we're calling the display. Don't know how I do this. He's new. He's new. This is the dispatcher, and this is the outrageable language. We're going to rename them before release so that it's not confusing. But uh, in the past, there was only one religion, so calling it RE made sense. Now that's just confusing. So we're going to change that before we release it. But that's what it looks like today. Can you make the slides full screen? It's on the bottom. It's got the arrows. All the Who is that? Who's talking right there? What's going on? Yeah. All right. Next slide. Yeah. I'm sorry, I'm new. <laughs> <laughs> so that first chunk is the dispatcher. It's probably going to want to be listed first because that's its job. We haven't tried not listing it first. I guess what happens is basically the peps won't, the peps won't, the dime peps won't get wrapped. All right. So don't do that. Then you don't have the dime peps. You, you want those. Uh, this is our rule language, this is the default, this is what's always been. So out of the box right now, this looks a lot like what 4.1 did. This is the 4.2 version, it's the same thing. Next slide. Now this has been updated with a custom RE. So in the out rule language, we are now, as a best practice, recommending you never touch core RE, because there's no reason to. It also means that you can't accidentally get stomped on an upgrade. We're going to try and sniff that and be careful, be nice. But if you don't touch it, you can't lose your work. You can always write your another rule engine file and just list it right here. These are loaded in an order. So if you have something that overloads one of the default rules in the core RE, if you put custom under core, your code's never going to get seen because it's going, to hit the, it's going to hit the endpoint in the core RE first, and if it doesn't fail, it's, it, it, it does its work and then off it goes. Your code will never get fired. So if you want to overload the peps properly, you have to list it above. So that's where you put it. You can call it whatever you want. Da, da, da. You can put it wherever you want. This chunk follows the same logic. This is the Python rule engine plugin configuration. By listing it here, the Python brain gets loaded before the IRL rule engine brain. The same <coughs> logic applies. If you overload a particular policy enforcement point, AC post park for put, or any of the other thousands that we now have, you're going to want it loaded before this one. right? If you were to switch these and put Python at the bottom, Every one of those core REs are still in, in flight, and if you've got the default ones in there, then they're going to 
take precedent over the one you just spent a lot of time and effort writing and your stuff's never going to fire. So you need them in this order. Next slide. This is the same slide, but now with the audit plugin instead of the, instead of the Python. So this is the default IRO drill language. There's no, I, did, I took out the custom, but the audit plugin is above the IRO drill language. Now you'll notice that there's a little more configuration for the audit plugin because we wanted to put the knobs here. Because it's a compiled C++ situation, it's already done. It's baked, right? We have to put the configuration knobs here. If you can read this, or if you can't read this, I guess, it still says that the plugin name is the RE Audit AMQP. The plugin specific configuration, which is a generic thing that we have in all three now, pep regex to match, audit underscore dot star, AMQP topic, AMQP location, and AMQP option. So these are just standard things that you would pass to an AMQP situation for declaring how and where your messages are going to get emitted. Right? So you can label them accordingly, and off they go. So with this installed, this next slide will make a little bit more sense. So the audit rule engine plugin, which has not been released, but is we've got and looked at it. And of course now because it's a plugin, it can be revved, you know, we can revision it independently from the core. If we find a bug, we can revision it again next week. The audit rule engine plugin can emit a single AMQP message to the configured topic from the last slide for every policy enforcement point encountered by the IROD server. Its job is to yell at the top of its lungs about everything the server is doing so that you can see it. That's its job. This AMQP message has all of the information because of that full serialization. Right? Remember that? All of those data structures are available to this plugin related to that particular operation, including who, what, how big it was, all the, all the context of what's going on in this connection is available to the plugin. And it's yelling all of that on the wire. Probably not the best for your security people to enjoy, but that's, that's the goal of this demo. Catching and analyzing these messages will allow you to see what the heck is happening on the network and in your server. We've never been able to have this uh, visibility before, and uh, it's pretty exciting. You can also, of course, graph it with your favorite graphing thing. So once this is installed, I had Justin type in a few letters, and he did an ILS. And on the other side, what came out was a bunch of yelling. And it hit 174 dynamic policy enforcement points. In addition to the four static policy enforcement points that have always been in there. So for an ILS, you could have already written rules in your rule engine in 4.1 and 4.0 that would have fired, and you would have seen stuff. You would have had some context for some of those, depending on where in the, in the flow you were. But it wasn't the full serialized data structure. But now it is. And so we have 178 policy enforcement points that are hit for an ILS. And you can instrument whatever logic, whatever policy, whatever it is that your company needs to have happen to make the grown-ups in charge happy, for the auditing people, for the regulatory agency who's watching you do your stuff. Whatever you need to do, you can log it, write it down. There's 178 points for you to choose from. Then I get has 154 in the map in my head. An iReg has a few more. An iPut has 234. It's, I think, probably the most complex of the basic uh, I commands because it, has more, it does more stuff. If you iPut a large file, and large file in the iRod room means larger than 32 megs by default, it's also a not to change. So with an iPut of a 1 gig file, there were 978 dynamic policy enforcement points hit and 44 static depths. That's over a thousand places to decide where you want to run your code. Now, a lot of those are repeats because that is a parallel put. Right? It, it did the work in many chunks and sent them along the way. 
So a lot of these are repeats, but they're still available to you. And the I meta is 106 plus 6, and that's 112. This is a sample of what the audit plugin is spitting out, because its only job was to spit out these AMQP messages, so all I did was I parsed those messages and pulled out one of the little tokens and put them on the screen. So you can see that right before a gen query, access control happens, and then right after. And of course, these are for the operation itself, so the operation happens in the middle. Right? These are the bread and the sandwich. And the, right? So the operation is happening between these. These are the pre's and the post. But you can't instrument the operation. The operation is the thing that you're actually doing the work with. This is merely the wrapper. You've got a database request. You've got an, uh, an object stat on the in the database or on the on the um, on the disk. And then right before it starts to write stuff to the network, so you've got the network write. Um, you've got an authentication agent starting. So all of these things are now instrumentable if you care. If you don't, they'll still happen. They're all no ops. That's fine. They've always been no ops. It's not going to slow anything down. But if you if you need them, they're there for you. This is the full I get. The left and then the right. This is that hundred and whatever the number was. Forty seven. Yes. Are those pets bracketed by the context? So the opstat, you know, oh this is an opstat in the context of the get operation. Are they linked? Yes. They have full context of what's going on. I didn't show it to you because it's a slide. But yes, you can see all of that in the, in the full. I should have put a full AMQP message up here so that you can see what's going on. But the deal is you implement a, so you can go to the rule engine and implement a pep that essentially is the string of five pre or posts of that operation. So essentially it's like declarative um, linking to the pep, right? Inside yes. of the one. Yes. And so the policy enforcement point is the, when you code it, the policy enforcement point is that fine-grained operation, not obstat within get. So you, you, you see what I'm saying? Yes. So is there a, a mapping inside the PEPs you can figure? Uh, yes. Yeah, the operation type is serialized and encoded in the uh, call to that policy enforcement form. But I guess what I'm saying is there's one PEP for pre-obstat and then within that pre op stat, you discriminate based on the larger context. On the, on the object, on the operation type, yes. Yeah, okay. And so you have what you need, if you care, to do the logic uh, and, and discriminate amongst the decisions you're making. <coughs> the examples are sparse because we've just made this up. <coughs> yes? Prepare changes for file each of those and if you make any changes, you know how much everything is out. That's right. Yeah. You would do it before and after in the postmortem. Yeah. And you would have you would have much more information to be able to we also have timestamps, yeah. Yeah, every one every one of these AMQP messages has a uh, microsecond uh, timestamp. Yeah. Next slide. So to annotate what's on screen a little bit, that's the connection. That's the authentication. Does the file exist? Please give me the plot, right? And then the teardown of the bottom. So conceptually, it's just an I get, but now you've got way more detail than you've ever had before, if you need it. Those are the six uh, original static PEPs, right? So before, you could write the policy for that. That, 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 or that. But now you've got tremendous more flexibility. This slide is to illustrate graphically for the first time the concept that an iput is a copy and a register. Right? When you do an iput, your data goes into the system, into the vault, and then it gets registered. It's two steps. Okay. An iReg is just that second step. So you'll note that when you compare the full story of an iGit and a full, uh, a full story of an iReg and a full story of an iPut, all the put is is a reg plus some other stuff. And that other stuff is the data movement. The rest of it's the same. 
So you can now conceptually and visually understand that those are actually pretty much the same thing, except one does the data movement, the other one doesn't. It's neat. Like, I knew that, but I had never seen it before. Next slide. So here's the shiny part. We haven't built the back end of this pipeline yet, because it was a lot of work to get all that stood up for the demo. So I just gave you a fake screenshot. IROTS, with this particular plugin, can yell can yell AMQP on the wire. With a different plugin, you can yell something else in the plugin, right? But with this plugin, we're doing AMQP. AMQP 1.0 for those following along at home and know about that stuff. ActiveMQ is the enterprise Apache service mix component that handles many message types. It's a broker and can listen. It's got its own plugin infrastructure, and so it can listen all kinds of different formats. We went with AMQP. We could have done anything. It's holding on to all those messages. That's its job. It's a broker. The standard, standard now, industry standard, ELK stack of Logstash, Elasticsearch, and Kibana, all open source projects. You can stand that up on a single machine together. And Logstash goes and talks to the broker and says, hey, you got any messages for me? Cool. And sucks them down, right? Logstash's job is basically a translation unit between a message coming in and then putting it in the database, aka known as Elasticsearch. So Logstash is running on a poll, and it speaks those two right now. The best way to, as, as I can figure out how to do it, is through the Stomp protocol, just another standard bot, standard that people came up with, right? Nerds in a room came up with standard. So, IROD's is screaming AMQP to active MQ. It's the broker, it'll hold on to them. This is a store and forward. Logstash will come along and pick them up in the stomp format. Logstash will then translate them into whatever, and we don't have any filters right now written for IROD yet, but this is a, a, a tiny matter of a tiny text file to do the translation from Logstash into whatever is most useful for Kibana. So it goes into Elasticsearch, and then Kibana is a dashboard app, a dashboard building and management app where you construct the things that you care about. So if you care about transfer rates, if you care about number of users, if you care about whatever you care about, you can draw pictures, right? Yay, it's fun. All the data's in there, you can draw whatever picture you want. We don't have any, at this point, any pre-baked analytics for this. But again, all of these dashboards are themselves defined in tiny text files like a JSON file. So if someone comes up with one that's amazing looking, we can ship that one as the default for our plugin. We can say, use this. And now you'll be able to see all your stuff. We haven't gotten there yet, but it should be pretty trivial. So what is it yelling? Is this Avro, or what, are the, what is the structure of these AMQP messages? Has that been standardized yet? This was Cupid. That was the library. We are taking all of the data that has been serialized into the rule engine interface and jamming that into JSON and getting that over the wire. So is there a standard JSON that represents all of the sort of standard IROTS operations like your static? Uh, I should have shown an example why I didn't do that. Um, yes. In the sense that they are, once they're serialized, they just get translated into JSON and piped over the wire. And that's just all key value pairs. It's just it's just key value. It's, it's nothing deep. It's nothing nested. Okay. Um, it, you know, there's a timestamp. There's a user. There's a. It's just key value, and, and it's all on one line, so it's really easily parsable. Um, every one of these are extremely standard, industry grade products that we don't have to build as long as we yell in the right format. Okay. Um, so since we make a lot of use of this in our infrastructure. Yeah. Um, we would be happy to be part of you know, whatever you guys want to take off. Is in Elasticsearch, how you lay it out is where the value is. Coming <coughs> in doesn't get you to far. We, we haven't done that yet. Uh, yeah. And we've burned ourselves a few times. And so we, we have some best practices. And likewise, um, an important part that's not very well known is you can write a lot of good analytics on top of Elasticsearch. So you have plugins for R and other that you can then start adding services, so we are looking to add um, data evaluation services, so 
how much has this been accessed by whom? Exactly. And can we then create a policy to then send this piece of data either back at multiple times and so we look to make it more sort of a feedback loop rather than a one-way traffic. Absolutely. Um, and so uh, if, you, if you want to pick off something that is a community effort, yeah. I would love to see a proof of concept slash demo of feedback loop for rates, not speed, um, because then you can plug that back into our uh, uh, tree, the, the um, composable resource logic, and now you can start putting your data on the fast network, on the slow network, based on what you're seeing coming out the back end. So there are two places also that we are looking to do this. Uh, one of them is to lock to do with the network traffic. So we require a lot of our heavy sites to send us Persona. Mm -hmm. And Persona provides you an API. And so what is perceived traffic uh, by Persona and what is actually realized by the user, yeah. this is sort of where we are trying to use that as the, the yeah, this, this will give you deep insight into the difference. So I would encourage you to sort of look at it more holistically yeah, this will be worth uh, spinning up a working group around for one. Um, two, to speak to the standardization, this is pure auditing. If we're going to use something else, we will have another plugin for indexing. We can have another plugin for any other type of service we want to reach out to, and that's where we get to defining standards. Yeah, because this is my ulterior, ulterior motive, so. Neurob like yeah. fell right into yeah. the trap I made, which is essentially that we want to that you know uh, we want to adopt the cyber stack right so we would like to see everything about like a standard set of messaging. Yeah, I, I and, agree 100. Yeah. percent And to have the messaging different for auditing versus different for indexing kind yeah. of bothers me, right? This is only a plugin. Only yeah. To see what we could do, and our effort was to be as standardized as possible. Nobody's in the room when we made this, right? Now we have a room. Let's decide what it looks like. Swizzle a couple brackets and colons, and you're in your bit. It should be the same. Yeah, because that's going to allow like all the yes. other products to hang off of it rather sure. than. Uh, yep. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I, I think I would also try to say the same thing. We should have a reading room. Sure. Yeah, Number two, we should also have a topics ontology. If you're sending the ARTB messages, yep. if you have an ontology of topics, and probably the working group can deal with that if you want. And then you can map process on top of that topic. Yeah. We, if I didn't have these slides, we wouldn't be having this conversation. So we had to build something, no, no, it's good, it's good. and then everybody's in hands. That's why Jason cut his stock short. That's exactly right. Yeah. Brilliant. As this is uh, our code, um, uh, is there a configuration option to um, to select which patch on the shadow accounts? Uh, uh, right now, it's all of them. That the the policy. That if you if, yeah, go back to the configuration screen. Uh, back uh, three more. Right. Uh, there. So right now it's this regex, audit underscore dot star. It's all of them. If you don't want all of them, you don't have to do all of them. So this one's a somewhat flexible, but it's still going to be doing AMQP in a certain format. So it doesn't address the other question, but yes, it is flexible in the sense it doesn't have to yell everything. And that's based on the naming of the dynamic policy enforcement points. So if you only want the data, the high-level data OBJ operations, you just, you know, yeah. add that in. Or if you only want the file option operations, you know, you want you both of those. Servers. Yeah, if you want both of those, you can build your yeah. regular expression. Two things. So we require a restart and I think you. These are live. Do the online. Every time a new connection is made to IRONS, the server spins up an agent. The agent grows its brain from the database. It gets all of the stuff, right? All the stuff. This is one of the things that gets instantiated in that agent, and it's live. So if you have a typo, it's broken immediately. But it's also nice for reconfiguration. Is there, is there anything executed in the listener process of IRS, or is it all in the agent? Uh, we haven't done anything with listening for these yet. No. But that's what I was saying earlier. Like, once we have a, another plugin that listens, you could Type it back from some analytics engine and then dump it into the database. And then the database would have the information to inform perhaps where data goes when it's coming in. And you could have a feedback loop. 
We have this is, we have hand waving because nobody's written, written yet. You have an example of listener for the customer. We do have a listener. Oh, an, a, a client that listens. <coughs> yes, that will, that's how I got this information actually. Uh, we had a custom little Java client that caught these messages and wrote them to a file. So what you're seeing is uh, the printout of the file, basically. Yeah, but that was trivial. It's just a parsing exercise. Uh, I think there was another slide after. Yeah. Oh, that's good. <laughs> <laughs> All right, excellent. No? What? Yes. All right, it's 10 o'clock. I think I'm over. Who's doing timekeeping now? 10 10. Oh, beautiful. I have, nothing, I have nothing else to say. Seven minutes after Brian. Yeah. I have a question for you. Oh, jeez. <laughs> you had mentioned how much the uh, make procedure improved the installation time. Can you give me statistics? Um, the, so the CMake is the build, the build system. Uh, it was taking, <coughs> what do you think? The build system used to take, on a fast computer, Nine, nine, minutes. nine minutes on our on our workstations in the office, which are pretty beefy. Um, they're faster than your laptop. And then now it's two. Uh, to get the packages, it's two minutes, but you don't have to rebuild everything now. That's it's true. Not a nightmare. So if you just change one file, now you still have to rebuild like four hundred things and nine when you change, but it yeah. only compiled, so you might take. 12 seconds. A deep bug build might take 30 seconds. So yeah, at least it's, it's not a big deal. Like so our iteration time has, has uh, gotten significantly better.